where we can hear from our special guest scientist. Our special guest scientist has a uh, electronic footprint that contains no biography of any sort <laughs> that I can find on the internet. So he popped out of a test tube, a ready-made PhD student. <laughs> Machines and microscopes that allows him to see what they're up to. Uh, he works in the Department of Physics in the groups of Professor Ulrich Kaiser and Jeremy Baumberg. Um, our soon to be Dr. Kevin Lynn. Please give it a round. Thanks, James, for the nice introduction. <laughs> We should go back to the test you point. Um, there is something to that. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to speak to you a bit about my PhD research and the journey it's taken me on over the past four years, which has been a bit of a long and winding. I guess that's quite long as far as PhDs go. So, as with many things in life, it started with a proposal. <laughs> And post -op to a young, innocent PhD student <laughs> who, not knowing any better, accepted and then suffered for the next. <laughs> so, the idea of the project was to create the first working demonstration of a nano machine. You can think of this as a tiny robot. So, we wanted something that would perform a simple task at a really small scale. For example, putting one piece of something and another piece of something together to create a bigger something. So one plus one equals two. It's a simple assembly process. The thing is, besides actually making something that can assemble other objects, you also want a way to look at this. And in the proposal, this was recognized. There was kind of a small mention that, yeah, we'll also do some microscopy. Well, as it turns out, that became basically the whole project. <laughs> it was much harder than we thought. So why is it so hard to see small things? First, we have to establish how small we're talking about. So if you consider like your hair, the thickness of human hair on the head is typically around 100,000 nanometers. So hair is even something so thin, it's really big on the nanoscale. Compare this to the thinnest hairs you can find, perhaps the ones on your hand, on your skin, if you look really carefully, the finest hairs that you have are closer to 10,000 nanometers, still pretty big. So the nanoparticles and nanomachines that we're interested in are a thousand times smaller in the range of 10 to 100 nanometers. You could fit them a thousand times over into the width of a hair. So we need a microscope that can allow us to see inside this really small space. Now there are a few challenges that occur when you go to this length scale, and the main one is that the particles you're looking at are smaller than the wavelength of light itself. So normally, the way that you see something, for example, a reflection in a mirror, you have light that's bouncing off. <laughs> you have light that's bouncing off this flat surface. You can think of the light as tiny droplets or water balloons that are just bouncing off the surface. And so wherever they hit, they simply reflect and convey the information about what's at that position in space. So you basically relay an image of the object, which is quite accurate. However, if the object that's being looked at is much smaller than the light itself, you can think of the light as being a water balloon that hits a small pebble and therefore bursts. So the water balloon opens up the light which is the water in this analogy, spreads out and ripples out into space. As a result, you don't actually get a clear image of what's going on, but instead just a messy, blurry thing. <laughs> so that phenomenon, which is called diffraction, gives us what we call the diffraction in optics, which is for anything that's sufficiently small, you can't get a clear picture of it. And this is a fundamental limit, which makes it blurry. Now this is a problem if you want to see what a nanomachine is doing, because fundamentally if you think about a nanomachine that's doing some sort of action, that involves changing its shape. But if it's much smaller than the light, then you can't actually see its shape. And this was the warning that I was given during my first year by her, my distinguished professor of physics, who definitely knew what he was talking about. However, whether we were foolish, brave, or just didn't know any better, we carried on anyway. <laughs> 
So that brings us to the next problem, which is even if even before you want to see the shape of something, can you actually see the thing at all? Because if your object, say this small pebble that I'm talking about, is really small, think of it now as a tiny needle, where if you threw a water balloon at it, the water balloon could simply pass through the needle, and the water balloon would maintain its structure, it would not break apart, and it would almost be as if nothing had happened at all. The only traces that you would see would be a tiny bit of liquid that would remain on the needle, which would then break apart. And this would be a very, very small scattering component, but most of the light would simply go through as if there's nothing there. So the problem with small things is that they're nearly invisible. How do we get around this? The way is to use the wave properties of light to our advantage. So we can use a phenomenon called interference, where if you bring in an additional wave, let's say that now in my tank of water with a rock, I start to shake it or I push the boundary. As I push the wall, I create a wave, a ripple that moves outwards. And this much stronger wave interacts with the very weak scattering that I get from my small particle. The combination of these waves adds up to give what we call an interference pattern, which contains more information about the object than we otherwise would get. So by doing this, what we see instead is now, you can think of an analogy like if you want to see a small object like a, a ball or an egg that's underneath a tablecloth, if it's a plain white tablecloth that's completely smooth, you won't really see what's, where the object is because it's quite featureless. However, if you had a patterned tablecloth that has a striped pattern on it or a checkered pattern, then it becomes very obvious where the tablecloth is being distorted by the presence of the object. So in the same way, that's how we see things by interference more clearly than if there was no reference pattern there. Now, that's great. So what do we actually see in the microscope? Well, what we get, it looks something like if you were to drop a stone into a pond and see the waves rippling out. So we see these sorts of rings surrounding each other, concentric ring patterns, which move around in space. We don't see the particles themselves, but we can, see, we can tell where they are by seeing the trace of waves that they leave behind in their wake. This allows us to see the particles, see small particles, and tell where they are in space, which is great. But we still can't see the particles themselves or see their shape. However, so there's a but, there's always a but. <laughs> we found, to our surprise, pleasantly, that under certain circumstances, you can actually see in the ripple pattern created by a particle signatures of its shape. So if you had a round particle versus a triangle-shaped particle, they would create slightly different ripples outside them, which is somewhat surprising, but in any case, useful. So we just ran with it. Um, and having now seen this in simulations, experiments, and hopefully soon finishing verifying in theory, we are quite confident that this is the case. So what that means is that we can now bring it right back to the start with our nanomachines and find ways to design nanomachines that will actually be more easy for us to visualize. So instead of just being a formless shape, we could actually have a way to tell if the nanomachine is flexing or doing some other motion by strategically designing it. So that's basically where I got to in my research. Unfortunately, as I've come now basically to the end of my PhD, this will probably be something for the next student to do. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's how it is. And probably we can propose the same project again. <laughs> Except this time they were actually a professional. <laughs> Thanks to Kevin for providing pretty much the only real science you'll hear tonight.